Shalom and welcome. We are live from Israel, Australia, and from USA. Uh, we are global, global healers. I know healing myself and healing, healing the world. My name is Dr. Tova Goldfein. I am a chiropractor and a rehabilitation specialist. And for those 35 years, uh, my passion has been helping people with chronic pain, stress illness, anxiety, autoimmune disease. And every day I am so blessed to watch people heal themselves and see the power of the human body. It's, it's like what I've been learning in the last 35 years is that we, we are not fighting the pain. We are meeting the pain. And that's when people can become pain free. It's, it's a bit like a love affair. And on that note, I'm going to um, give it over to my co-host, Rose. Hi. Good morning from Australia. Have you ever been afraid to chance exercising? If someone led you through that way, would you follow? We've got Eddie, who's going to take us through his journey and how he um, got back into exercise and has now broadcasts um, a fitness program around the world. He covers, um, he said he's got people watching him from South Korea. Is that right, Eddie? Uh, all well, sorts so, of places. You know, all sorts of places, yeah. I think, yeah. Um, yeah. I think the last time I actually ran analytics from my podcast, it was something like 115 countries have listened, something like amazing. that. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So there's 115 people. Sorry, <laughs> let me rephrase that. 115 countries that have been touched by Eddie's work. Amazing. So uh, my name's Rose Hoey. I'm an intensive short-term dynamic psychotherapist, which is in short ISTDP. We look at how attachment has affected our, our present lives and release that original pain and allow patients to be free of chronic pain. I'll introduce you now to Eddie. Oh, sorry, beforehand, Let's do a short yeah. meditation. Now, you know, I was asked, why do we do this in the beginning? Um, what we found is that often we're in our thoughts and not in our bodies. And it's very difficult for people who've always been in their thoughts to actually recognize that they have a body. And the breath is the part that we are in control of and it doesn't normally cause us pain. So if you can just be aware of your jaws, your shoulders, your hips, soften them out as best you can at the moment. Close your eyes and we will breathe in and out for a couple of minutes, moments should I say. So with a breath in, through your nose, inhale, pause, Exhale, inhale, pause, exhale, inhale, pause, exhale. Try and keep that as part of your routine. I'll hand you over to Eddie now, who has a fascinating and lovely story to tell us. Thanks, Eddie. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Um, like I said, my uh, my name is Eddie Lindenstein, and I am in Seattle, Washington. So uh, as about about as far away geographically in the world as as I could possibly be from the two of you. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, so I do a weekly podcast called Mind and Fitness Podcast, uh, available every Wednesday, and um, it's 125 episodes in right now at this point, and um, it's something that I have. Uh, become very passionate about it began towards the end of 2017 I took a few month break uh, but it's now run a brand new episode every Wednesday for over two years I think 107 or 108 straight weeks which is pretty cool and the numbers and the listenership has just gone you know up and to the right uh, however it is that you're watching <laughs> um, but uh, I get I get these really cool emails and messages from people all over the world um, and I think that one of the things that's really interesting about um, 
pain and chronic pain in people that, that would be listening to this, that whether it's their back or their shoulders or their ankle or their knees or whatever it is, that I think a lot of times this is a very isolating feeling. It's a very isolating thought. You feel like as, uh, as much as you hurt, you are the only person around that hurts that much. And then kind of as you start to branch out and meet more people like this, like, like I have, you start to learn that, no, this is... It, it, Michael Galinsky, who made all the rage about Dr. Zorro, says that this is a human condition, and it really is. Um, and now I start finding it, and you know, I, I see that Scotty Pippen, who played for the Chicago Bulls, I think that he probably went through a lot of this. Tiger Woods has gone through a lot of this, so it it's uh, it's it has a lot of consciousness. But what you're, I'm going to go back and really begin the story of this, uh, give you guys a good 15 minute background on. Kind of where I began and where this stuff began and where I am now. Um, I am a competitive weightlifter and a uh, competitive crossfitter um, out in the, the Pacific Northwest here in the United States. And um, for those of you who don't know, weightlifting is different than bodybuilding or powerlifting, and it's a pretty simple sport. There, it's the actually the only um, barbell sport that's used in the Olympics, which is why it's called Olympic weightlifting. Um, but it's just the snatch and the clean and jerk, and for a competition, you have three chances at each lift that you do. So I started competing in that in 2013. Um, so 2013, 2014, 2015. And then uh, at the end of 2015, I was training for a competition and I had a shoulder dislocation. Um, that was kind of the first uh, like really serious injury I had sustained ever with doing anything athletically. Um, it, uh, it definitely hurt a lot and it probably took two months before I could get an MRI. When we got an MRI and the diagnosis was that I had uh, tore my labrum, I tore my rotator cuff, and I broke the top of my arm. It was a fracture at the, at the top of the humerus meets the, uh, the glenoid. And so um, they had recommended surgery, um, and I was in such pain for so long leading up to that MRI that I was on painkillers constantly um, just to kind of be able to get me through the day. Uh, but then it was interesting because when I got the MRI, in fact, I, I used to do – I used to do like a vlog and I was watching it a couple of months ago. My vlogs are coming right around this time. And one of the things that I had said is that um, I'm heading for the MRI today and my shoulder is, is in tremendous pain. And then I said that I had stopped taking my painkillers that morning um, because I wanted to have as much symptoms as I, as I possibly could going to the MRI so I could really tell a clear picture of what my body felt like. Uh, I went and got the MRI. The next day I went through and did the results with the doctor. And she had said, you know, yes, you have all of these things going on in your shoulder, but um, you can probably continue doing your sport and surgery isn't needed right now. You know, you could wait a couple of months. And, um, and I remember leaving that appointment and this didn't click with me until a couple of years later after reading the Sarno book and kind of studying this stuff more. But when she said uh, that, you're, you know, you can continue doing the thing that you love, which I could stop doing. Um, I, I went to the gym that day and I had very little pain uh, leading into surgery. And it was kind of like, a, it, you know, something had shifted. Um, but again, I didn't recognize it for a couple of years. And so surgery date came and I went through and I had it because I just figured, hey, even though I'm 99% pain free, uh, like you read the stories online about athletes who have similar injuries and they're talking about how this thing is affecting them years and years down the road. So I had a lot of fear going into surgery. I had surgery, the, rec the expectation was it will take me eight to 10 months um, to get back to full speed or to get back to, to you know, where the doctors would clear me for all activity. Uh, had a surgery in April of 2016 and went through and uh, did the whole rehab program. I actually got cleared in five months and one day, so it was very fast. Uh, in fact, the, the surgeon had said that this is one of the fastest recoveries that he's ever seen from a surgery like that. Um, the day, uh, the day before I got, I, I was going to get cleared for all activity. I remember I was in the gym and. Um, I had my first back spasm, and I'd never experienced something that was that felt quite like this, uh, where everything just sort of locked up, my shoulders locked up, my neck locked up. Um, and I remember I went to the appointment the next day, and I told them what had happened the day before, and I freaked out. I thought I'd re-injured my shoulder, and they said that, uh, you know, we don't know what's going on, but your shoulder mechanics are great, and, you know, we don't really know what's going on. We can recommend that you go to see another person, but nothing that we can find clinically would lead that there would lead us to believe that there's some kind of a big problem here. So they kind of shrugged it off. Um, but you know, that was sort of the first instance of a doctor saying, "Hey, this this thing that you have, we don't know what it is, 
And so I spent the next several months chasing doctors. It was almost like every, I would say if, in a given week, like a five day span, I probably saw one medical doctor, one or two chiropractors and a physical therapist, and then some kind of an alternative method, whether it be an acupuncturist or a, a rolfer or a massage therapist or something. So that made up my week for four straight months or so. Uh, and then uh, I continued training through all this. I was like, well, I can still lift. And actually, when I lift, it doesn't even hurt as bad as when I'm just at rest, when I'm just totally still. Um, so uh, that should have tipped me off, but it did not. And so eventually, um, a few months into this, I just stopped training completely. So I'm, I'm totally done until I can figure out what's going on with my body. Because by this point, um, I had IBS symptoms as well. And I had a lot of nerve problems. I, I had a lot of issues where I was getting numbness and tingling in my fingers. Uh, I was having a, a lot of tension and a lot of spasming going on in my in my neck. And the predominant diagnosis was thoracic outlet syndrome. And if you Google thoracic outlet syndrome, it's essentially it's like a death sentence for an athlete. Um, mm -hmm. the, the visuals that, that come from that are that you have nerves and arteries that are getting choked by muscles and all these kind of things, and that the only way to have it is the only way to get rid of it is neck surgery. And uh, so it was recommended to me to have neck surgery and have my scalenes removed and my pec minor removed to alleviate um, the nerve, uh, the nerve and trap. So uh, this went on for months. I mean, I, this was 10 straight months, I think, of, of dealing with all this stuff. And uh, I went to the University of Washington uh, to see my 25th doctor. And uh, it was, uh, so she's uh, Dr. Kimberly uh, Hanscott, or sorry, Dr. Kimberly Harmon. Um, and she is the she's really well known around here because the University of Washington football team. Uh, she's the head physician for them, and this is the United States of so football, meaning the, the the ball that you throw, not the ball that you kick. Because I know. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, but one thing that, that was so different in her approach, uh, she saw my because I had imaging with me, I had MRIs, and I had um, ultrasounds, and I had uh, EMG studies, all of which suggested that I had major problems going on in my neck and my upper back, and I had nerve lesions, and I had all this. And she just said, uh, <laughs> I remember the first thing she asked me after she did maybe a 45-minute full analysis of every, like physical testing of everything, um, and she asked me, tell me what your life is like. And I told her that I was a, a high-performing sales uh, salesperson in the software industry. And then I have a young daughter, and um, she asked me, you know, what, what is work life like? And I said that I'm the only person in my company that has made five straight presidents clubs, which means that you're the, one of the top sellers in the company. And she had said, I, I you know, I see all this imaging, and I, I think this might be like stress related. And I said, no way, like I have all these images, I have all the tests, I have these, books, look at all these. And she said, I don't care what the tests say, uh, I think this is stress related. And she started talking about, um, going to see a therapist. It was actually the first doctor I walked out without a prescription for a painkiller. And it was the first one I walked out with a prescription to, hey, see this sports psychologist. Um, wow. one, of the, one of the things that really struck me is that, and she's not like a TMS doctor, that's not her forte. I've been in contact with her ever since all this stuff happened. Um, but one of the things that really struck me is that she talked about, and I think back to my athletic injury when she was telling me this, is that for a college game day to get the, say that you have a top receiver on the team, was used to having 10 catches and 150 yards and two touchdowns, and that's what they're used to. And suddenly, they have a game where they have, they've dropped the ball five times, they have one or two catches for 10 yards, and they don't score one time. She said, it, it, it may take several days of just literally working with our team sports psychologist to get them in a frame of mind to even be ready to go in to have a game day um, the following week. And so I just thought that that stuff was really interesting. She's intertwining my business, my career life with this sports injury, with all these nerve issues that I've had that don't seem related at all. Um, and a couple of weeks went by, and I, I mean, by this point in time, I had like traveled to different states to have a procedure done on my neck that didn't work, paid, a, paid for it out of pocket. Like I was probably, I don't know, twenty thousand dollars deep, <laughs> the U.S. with uh, with all this stuff. And um, I was searching on Amazon, I think, not long later for like more mobility equipment, right? Because she hadn't, she hadn't recommended Sarno or anything like that. And uh, one of the suggested purchases was healing back pain. And I read it in a couple of days, two or three days. And I was thinking, you know, a lot of this stuff um, really resonates with the, the high performing people pleaser. And I sort of had like a moment of submission at that point. Where I was like, I tried all these other things. Some doctor probably would have found it by now. And I started training uh, back in weightlifting a couple days later, and then I went to the gym that I had previously trained at before all this stuff started. 
and I bought several months uh, paid in full in advance because I was like, if I'm going in, I'm going all in. Um, I'm not, I don't, I'm not interested in doing this half in, half out thing. Um, there's been some bumps in the road since then, but the bottom line is that I'm stronger physically than I have ever been, which is an odd thing to say because of the dire straits I was in for so long. Um, but that's kind of where all that stuff uh, originated. And, and from that, I ended up starting this uh, podcast, which it became as a, hey, I'm going to do a podcast about um, fitness. You know, uh, what do you do for your workout programs? What do you eat? All this kind of stuff. And the second or third guest that I had on was an ex-Marine who started talking to me about, we. this was not an intentional path. It was just like we had a conversation and it led to him talking about being at war and losing friends in uh, like IED explosions. And he said that he wakes up with migraines, losing, you know, when he starts thinking about losing friends and he has these killer headaches. Uh, and that's pretty much where this whole conversation went. And from there, I was like, I'm getting more messages about this episode than any of the other stuff that you're doing about, uh, you know, what are you eating and you know, how many sets and reps do you do and all this stuff. And from then on out, it uh, became entirely a TMS podcast. I've had Steve Ozanich on and Nicole Sachs on and Dr. Uh, David Hans come and um, I mean I've had it's pretty much a who's who. Basically Dr. Sarno hasn't been on it and that's, that's it. Uh, well so, he can't can he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I don't know it's uh, the whole thing's just been really uh, wild and I you know I'm, I'm not I'm certainly not immune to having symptoms but what I am immune to is allowing um, symptoms to sort of carry me to a dark place again. Um, and so that's that's what I would say. I guess that's my my story, and I'm sticking to it. And I did it in <laughs> 15 minutes, like I said I would do. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know. I want to ask the first question um, about really when you have a muscle spasm and you're literally working through the pain, knowing that you're okay, nothing is wrong with you. You will not injure yourself. It's safe, even though there's physical things on the x-ray or the MRI, you know that what you're doing, I mean, that's sort of just where a lot of my patients might get stuck. And I, I want you to talk a little bit about working through the pain and getting on the other side to see that it's in our head. Oh, we've lost Eddie. Where'd you go, Eddie? Come back, Eddie. <laughs> of all people. <laughs> of all people. Yeah. There he goes. Yeah. Oh, he's back. Hey, okay. yeah. <laughs> Countdown. I, it's weird. I didn't press anything. So here yeah. I am. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I think for, for me, um, and this is a very, very similar thing, but this is what I was thinking before he said it on my podcast. But uh, Dr. Schubiner was on my podcast a number of months ago. And um, a phrase that he kept using that I thought was really uh, apropos was the, the investigation's over, you know, case closed, basically. And for me, the case closed wow. uh, relating to the question that you had said is that uh, when I just think about this stuff logically um, and I say, why would it be that I can train, I can pick up the weights and the barbells and stuff behind me. And when I train, I don't necessarily feel as in pain as I do when I'm not doing anything. Just like the logical side of me would say that doesn't really, that doesn't equate, that doesn't really make sense. Um, and that's kind of how I guess that I can get past that. Um, you know, there, there's symptoms that are not as easy to, to pinpoint in that way. Like when I had the IBS stuff going on, you know, it, it felt like I had a clenched fist in my stomach all the time. Um, so that one's not as easy. But uh, I know that that's something that I've overcome too. A really terrible uh, dairy allergy was something that was felt crippling for, uh, for years, a long time. Um, asthma and allergies. I was on five, four or five um, prescription asthma and allergy medicine, and we've had a terrible spring here. I see people all the time complaining on Facebook locally about how bad the pollen is. Right. And I mean, I'm, I'm out, you know, riding a one wheel or skateboard or riding my bike or riding my motorcycle or whatever with my kids and my friends, and I don't feel any of that stuff. Um, whereas I used to, if I just stepped outside, my, my eyes are swollen and I'm sniffling the whole day and all this kind of stuff. Um, so I think it's just, it's being able to sort of take a step back and I'm just kind of think like, is this pain logical or is it not logical? And what's your answer to that? 
It's it's yeah, it's usually not logical, okay. and sometimes there, there's almost like some uh, some wizardry, some trickery. I was uh, I run a Facebook group um, on this stuff, and we've got about three thousand members at this point. Uh, and if you're interested in joining it, if you're not already part of it, it's TMS hyphen the mind body syndrome. It was actually started by Steve Ozanich, um, mm. but but now and a buddy of mine, Brad, uh, run it, and we're kind of like you know no nonsense, no BS kind of guys when it comes to this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning like we even have screening questions now. It's like if you haven't read Sarno or you don't understand the concepts or you don't really accept them, like right. we don't want people coming in and right. saying that, hey, this stuff is all BS. We just don't need any of that. But I was telling him that recently I've been dealing, you know, because in the United States, well, the world, dealing with a global pandemic right now is an interesting time for people that have had these kind of pain mm -hmm. symptoms. Um, because in my case, like I, I went from uh, being an outside salesperson that was going into offices and meeting 10 or 12 new people every single week taking my kids to school, picking them up at the end of the day, and now everything is inside. All four of us are home all the time. My kids are not at school, so I'm homeschooling half the day, and I'm uh, working the other half the day uh, and still trying to find time to work out and have a life of some kind, right? Um, so all that stuff's really tough. And at the end of March, <laughs> so uh, going to a hospital right now is not the greatest place to be, as you can imagine. And so... But I thought, hey, in the quarantine, because I had a trip at the end of March planned, and it got canceled because nobody's flying and nothing's open and all the sporting events are closed, um, I thought, hey, what's a cool hobby I can take up during the quarantine? And I thought, I'm going to take up skateboarding. That's <laughs> In my mid-30s, that's what I want to pick up. So uh, I went skate. I tried to go skateboarding, and I was 45 minutes in. I was actually doing really well, and it started to rain a lot. Um, but the board slipped out underneath me when I was going down a hill and trying to take up a, a really hard rate. And I, uh, I mean this hurt way worse than the shoulder dislocation years ago in the arm break. The, the, the ankle sprain that I got from that was unlike any, I mean, I thought my entire leg, if I would have looked down and my leg was gone, that's how much it hurt. That's, I wouldn't have been surprised. Uh, went to get imaged. It was actually the last day any of the urgent cares were going to be open here for a non-respiratory uh, symptom. She said there was no break. It was a grade one, you know, should be gone. You should be at full speed in a month or so. So this was two months ago. Um, and I was still having symptoms, you know, six or seven weeks later and didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me on why that would be the case. Uh, and then I sort of made a decision that this feels more like a TMS thing to me. And, well, you know, what a slippery way to be able to get that in, right? Because it is logical to think, hey, you slipped on the skateboard, you've never sprained an ankle, you have no idea what this thing feels like. Um, and now you're having all these symptoms and it's, it's a believable story. Uh, but the alternative to that, as soon as I made that decision, hey, the, this ankle thing is probably a TMS thing, um, I started getting symptoms all the way up and down my leg, almost like sciatic stuff. Uh, and then I was like, oh, that's not logical, right? So being able to step back and say that's not logical. And then I'm back to full, I mean, pretty much full activity. I haven't tested everything just because I haven't had enough time. But like I went running today. I did 300 squats today. I did, you know, so like, I'm doing all the things. Me too. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm, I'm doing all the things, and um, so I don't know. It's. Uh, I one of the words that I hate the most in a lot of this. Kind, not hate. Hates that word. That uh, I dislike the most, generally speaking, in the fitness world, is the is the term mindset or word mindset. Because I think it's such a blanket term that doesn't. It's one of those words that, like you say, and it doesn't really mean anything. Um, so I, I don't like applying it to this stuff. But it, I see it more, much more as like a frame of mind. Can you really can like can you mentally defeat all the preconceived notions that you have about medicine mm -hmm. um, that you've believed for so long? And mm -hmm. that's a tall task. Like it's not easy to anybody that's watching and listening to this that's tried to make that. It's not easy, but it can be done. Yeah. Mm. You know, I what do you think, Rose? <laughs> well, I'm fa fascinated by a word he used talking about mm -hmm. words. Mm -hmm. Linguistics is very interesting. Mm -hmm. You said you had a moment of submission. What mm -hmm. did that mean? Um, so I'm a big pro wrestling nerd, and they talk about submission a lot. So I, I love using that word. But uh, Yeah, but can you expand <laughs> a little bit? Because I think that's an important thing that people would um, resonate with because I think mm -hmm. they, you know, you had 25 doctors, and then you had a moment of submission. So. Yeah. There's some connection, and I uh, just think that it would be worthwhile to sort of explore it, maybe. Yeah. Um, so when I think back about when I think back to that time of going to see a new doctor every week, or going to you know see a new physical therapist or whatever every week, 
<clears throat> not only does it feel like an uphill battle all the time, but it feels very much like you're in the fight of your life to get your life back. Um, okay. you're, you're constantly fighting off the concept of symptoms and this is your new way of life and this is the new normal. And you're sort of rejecting the idea, but at the same time you keep, you know, every time you think you found the doctor, they don't have the answers or they don't have the answers that you think you want or mm -hmm. the symptoms don't really change. And so you're constantly fighting, fighting, fighting. But then when, uh, when the doctor at UW had said, I think this is stress related, it was kind of like, um, you know, again, I fought in the, in that meeting with her. I have this imaging, I have these diagnoses, I have this mm -hmm. thing that I can see that these nerves and these arteries are being trapped on these pictures. Here's these things, here's these things. Yes. But, but let's think about your life for a second and, and you know, all the different, all the different levels of stress that you have. And I'm just like, okay, you're right. Right. So it's just like, I'm just, I'm submitting and I'm tapping out and that's just the way it is. And, and I think about it um, in, in a lot of ways when I was a lot younger uh, as a teenager and in my twenties. And um, one thing that I was petrified of was commercial flights, getting on an airplane and flying really anywhere. And I've made that flight from, Seattle to LA to Australia, which is a long way to go. Um, <laughs> I think that, you know, that travel day was 20 hours or maybe even more than that. Um, but I remember I, every flight, it was like, I would get the sweating in the palms. I would get the heart racing. I would be gripping my wife's thigh sometimes, right? I'm like, Dang. it's getting like bloody, not really, but uh, I freaked out. Like I, and it was at every takeoff and every landing. And this would always, always, always happen. And then I was flying to Dallas for work. Uh, this is 10 years ago. And um, the plane, they're telling us that there's ice on the ground. So it's like an ice storm in Dallas, which I always think of Texas as this hot place that you never have to deal with this kind of thing. But it does snow in Texas. Um, and they said there was ice and there was wind and all this kind of stuff. And we're getting a little bit of turbulence as we're approaching uh, the plane landing. And I remember just, I, I, I didn't do this because I don't want people to think I was crazy, but I imagine myself almost like extending my arms out and just sort of like breathing in and just saying, if it goes down, it goes down. There's nothing I can do. And I remember that was a moment of submission in my life. And I didn't have a commercial airplane fear after that day. Wow. Uh, so it, oh. to me, it's very much the same thing. Does that, wow. Does that answer that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, how, how, how would we translate that? That's a lovely, a lovely, um, way of putting it um, that I've never um, thought of that, you know, because there's always this resistance to this pain and to this suffering, you know, I'm holding on to the suffering. And I thought that that's very powerful. It's very um, uh, strong. Um, have you used this sort of like in your podcasts and things like that, like that whole notion of letting go, because that's what you've been really like you've said submission, but it's actually letting go. And the other thing that crossed my mind while you were speaking is how can you go to 25 doctors and like they've done like 10, 20 years of training and then they don't know what's your problem. Is there any moment in that that, that you think, well, what's the matter with them? Or do you think, what's the matter with me? Uh, just sort of, you've got a really broad sort of scope and, and you're sort of talking about this all the time. And I'm wondering what, what, what were your thoughts when you went to the, all these different doctors? And, you know, everyone we've had on have been to, you know, your story is very similar to everyone else's and they've been to all these different people and they're trying all these different treatments. But... It's sort of like they don't meet, you know, there's, you expect when you go to the doctor that he's going to meet you or she's going to meet you and all of a sudden, and it took you 24, well, you did 24 and then the 25th sort of said, well, what else is happening to you? Mm -hmm. Which is a very ordinary, normal, beautiful thing to say to someone. And yet no one said it to you. Did that ever make you wonder? Uh, it did, um, because while it was going on, uh, mm -hmm. my thought was twofold. It was, um, this guy doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. And there's wow. something so deeply injured within me that I don't think anybody's ever going to find it. Wow. Wow. That's, that's important. Yeah. 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 That's important. Yeah. Like I'm uh, so imperfect or something. I'm so broken. 
I'm so well, and the, 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 and like the, the overall thinking about the fragility of the body, right? Uh, mm -hmm. is the thing that would cross my mind a lot because then I would start, you know, when one doctor wouldn't figure it out or they would say, uh, you you know, your, your fingers are hurting or your mid back is hurting, but I think this is actually coming from your neck. So now I'm thinking this is a neck issue and it's a back issue and it's a fingers issue and it's an IBS issue and my knees hurt and my, and I'm having sciatica. And so I'm like, I know these are all spinal nerves, but now I have areas that are in the lower part of the spine, the middle part of the spine, and the upper part of the spine. And so maybe my whole spine is compromised. And and then I'm starting to think, well, when could this have actually happened? Because, you know, I don't have, I wasn't in a terrible car crash. I never fell off a mountain, you know, any of these kind of things. I, I remember even thinking to um, when I had got, uh, <laughs> I, I got rear-ended in, this is during my shoulder rehab. It was very low speed. It was a drunk driver and it was me at a stop, stop sign and I saw him coming out of my, you know, rear view mirror. And realistically, it might've been five miles per hour, right? Like not fast at all. Uh, bumps into me and I start thinking back as the months go on uh, where I'm not having any, you know, not having any answers that I find to be uh, like find, helping me find my way. I start, thinking, yeah, I, I start thinking that, oh, well, maybe this thing when I got rear-ended nine months ago was caused a totally compromised spine up and down. Uh, you know? yeah. So it, it's just like it, it's fear compounding on top of fear and trying mm -hmm. to unearth all this mm -hmm. stuff. And it, like if I could give you all a tour of my garage right now and this massive box of mobility tools and books about injuries and rehabbing yourself and all this, it would blow your mind because mm – -hmm. Um, I mean, I wish I could get all my money back, right? Because <laughs> uh, I can go ahead and get a lot of cool new toys and stuff. But um, it, it's just, but it, again, now I can look back and I can say, <clears throat> logically, even though that thing happened with the car, uh, I still was lifting and I was in less pain than when I wasn't lifting. That doesn't really make any sense from a spine perspective. Yeah. Um, but when you're in, but you know, the other side of that is that when you're in the, when you're in the thick of it, it's tough to yeah. think that way. Yeah. So I want to yeah. say, I want to say, I want to just, I want to comment about a lot of things we've been saying, and I want our viewers and I want all of our community to know that, I mean, we're not for one second underestimating anybody's pain. I mean, the pain is real. And I think what's fascinating is that what the body mind can do and what it can cause that people have to understand how the brain is working and the education, what you learned and what you're doing on your show and we're trying to do is when people are educated, they understand what, the, like you can exercise with weights because you understand your brain. You understand you have endorphin secreting when you're lifting weights and you understand when you're cooling down, you may not have as many endorphins, but that, it's not like your pain is worse because you're not increasing, you're not secreting endorphins. Your pain is coming from your brain because your body is healing your pain all the time. And it's about blood and oxygen. I don't want to talk about that right now. I really want to just respond to, you know, the pain is real and we're not here to underestimate anyone. We're here to get to the bottom line. And your story is clearly you know, a little bit of shoots and ladders to get there and you got there and it's ongoing. And in response to that, Michael Goldberg, who is a friend of us all and yours, he would love to know what you do when you experience the bumps along the way. So um, let me clarify that when I uh, had mentioned bumps in the ropes, I mentioned it 10 minutes ago or so. Yeah. Uh, when, what I meant by that was that, um, even after I read the Sarno stuff and I got back to training, I would have sometimes these periods of time that would last a week or two weeks of not necessarily a new symptom, but like an exclamation point or an underline on an existing symptom that just felt way worse than it ever had felt before, way worse than it normally would feel. Um, and then I would make an appointment to go see a chiropractor or something. Uh, and you know, they would say that it's my, I, I need to go and get like, if my, if it was my mid back as an example, and go and see them and they would say, he would tell me that there was a fascia restriction and that I needed to start wearing orthotics and that I needed to come in for two or three times a week to have the fascia restrictions in my stomach um, manipulated. And so 
I played that game like half and half. I would say the first, I don't know, nine or 10 months, every eight weeks or so, I would be kind of like, I don't know. I kind of expected everything to be gone permanently and never have a symptom ever again by now. So it, the thing that took a really long time was understanding that um, we're still going to have these things flare up. Like it's still going to happen, um, but you can dissolve it incredibly quickly by recognizing it for what it is. And it, it will, I mean, it will almost certainly go away. And I think that, I mean, that happens all the time with me with, I mentioned the allergy and asthma thing a while back. Like that happens today. If I go, if I go outside and I start sneezing a couple times and I'm like, oh man, the pollen really is bad. And then I'm like, ah, but you're kind of under, like life is heavy right now. Mm -hmm. And usually okay. within, yeah, 30 to 45 minutes, I feel normal again. So like this stuff exists all the time, but you have to be able to catch it. So much of what's going on in our brain and our, that, that split of the subconscious versus the conscious brain, it's like 95% of it is stuff that's an auto program. So in order for me to be able to have the power to stop it, it's like trying to move a, you know, a hundred, a hundred mile per hour motorcycle and stick a spoke in its wheel or stick a, a stick in its wheels to get it to slow down. Like that's really hard to do. Um, so as far as the bumps in the road go, um, I would call the ankle thing, uh, certainly a bump in the road. Um, and when I think about five years ago, Eddie, and sort of how I would have responded to an ankle injury like that and kind of the ongoing and lingering issues, I probably would have seen a physical therapist. They would have given me um, something to go and do for a couple weeks. And then I would have went to see another one because the pain wasn't gone. And it would have been total freak out mode. Like that, and that's how it always was. And, and uh, one of the things, the first thing I did after I read the Sarno book, I don't think that in healing back pain, he recommended even doing this. Maybe he did. Um, but I had made a list because I started thinking like, okay, Dr. Harmon thinks it's due to stress. Uh, Sarno, same idea um, and a little bit deeper than that. But how can I give myself more proof? And so one of the things that I did was that I made this columned list where I wrote down every symptom that I could remember going back as far as I possibly could remember. Um, and this was, you know, this was knee injuries and this was development of allergies and development of asthma, uh, elbow issues. I would have a lot of like joint issues. And I always just assumed, hey, this is from training and, and that's just what happens when you're, when you're doing competitive sports. And that's how it is. But then what I started to notice is that it occurred like clockwork 100% of the time, which this was maybe 30 injuries and issues that I had listed. 100% of the time, it either happened in March, June, September, and December. And the, the relevance of that is that I'm a salesperson and that is the final month of every sales quarter. Wow. Yep. So to me, that's kind of like where, ah, oh, case is kind of closed again. Uh, <laughs> And usually I would also compete once every three months and it always was at the end of a quarter. So uh, being able to put two and two together, I haven't had, I used to get tendonitis in my knee and go and see a doctor and get an anti-inflammatory or cortisone shot. It was like every three months for years. Um, wow. Cause it would always, ha it would always happen in March, June. And like, I, I just thought, okay, this is the end of a trade of a 12 week training cycle. And I'm just, you know, my body's just beat up and that's what I need to go get. I read Sarno in June of 2017, and I have not had a knee tweak or tendonitis since that day. Um, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 And, I, and by the way, I train, I, I train harder and longer and heavier in the last three years than I had the previous 10 years, probably combined, and have had fewer. Um, wow. I've got another question that I think hopefully that uh, mm -hmm. viewers might like to know. You know, you've got grit and you've got determination and you've been in sales and you know it's sort of like you know you use the word submission but you know when I reflected while you've been talking I thought well you know you've got grit you've got a strong determination to achieve and I, I'm just wondering is that a lifelong thing that you're aware of has that always been your case um, how, could, how could others, I mean, my whole reason for asking this is because most people, you know, can find it somewhere and you found it. And often when we're looking at patients with chronic pain and, um, and other symptoms, um, you've got to remind them that, you know, um, there's a part of you that wants to work for you. There's a part of you that wants to be critical and there's a part of you that wants to work for you. 
can we find the part that wants to work for you? And, and you've demonstrated that in, in your talk just now, how that grit has come out. You know, like over the years, you've gone to the doctors, you've, you've listened to them, you've done what they've said, but at the same time, you've kept on your exercises, you've kept on your, your work. And, and I'm, I'm just wondering, is that something that, um, like that self-reliance or whatever, that, that's helped you? So uh, I've talked about this um, so many times with like a therapist that uh, I think if you and I had this talk two years ago or three years ago, I might get misty eyed telling the story or talking about it. <laughs> uh, but now since I've said it so many times, I don't think it's going to happen, but it'll probably be new for anybody that's listening to this, that also listens to the podcast. I don't think I've ever really talked about this stuff, um, but uh, you're absolutely correct. Um, so I grew up with three brothers. And uh, it's interesting because even though there's four boys, uh, none of us are whole blood brothers. So there's one adopted, that's my youngest. My uh, oldest just above me came from my mother's first marriage and my oldest uh, brother came from my dad's previous marriage. And growing up, uh, mostly around the time, my brother right above me um, had like a litany of issues, drug issues, alcohol issues constantly getting in fights and arguments with my parents. And I would observe these things growing up. So when I'm, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, he'd run away from home. My mom was freaked out. She doesn't know where he is, all these kind of things. And he's only 15 or 16 at the time. There's six years between us. Uh, but I remember um, being in elementary school, middle school, and high school, and never, ever being the kid that would bring upon issues of any kind. I worked hard for my grades. I, I, you know, I didn't get in any trouble. I still have never done a drug or smoked a cigarette to this day, and I'm 34 years old. Um, I didn't drink until I was 20, which in the United States, 21 is the legal age, but mm -hmm. uh, I had my first beer at 20, right? So I'm a pretty straight-laced, straight line guy for a long time. And um, I had just always thought, oh, this is just me, but to now I can look back and say, <laughs> I feel like maybe the reason that that was who I was so early on is because I felt like my brother is causing so many issues for my parents. I can't also cause issues for my parents. I see how much heartache it's taking them just to deal with him. And then also uh, my younger brother being adopted and having so many issues coming from the foster system in the state of California and kind of how all that shook out and some of his developmental issues because of it. I need to be the one that is not uh, causing issues or strife or any of that stuff. Um, and so that's always kind of how I felt as a little kid. And uh, coincidentally, I developed a lot of weight issues as a teenager. Um, and when I was 16-ish, um, I sort of put my foot down and said, I'm tired of being the really big kid. And I started going to the gym on that day. I had never worked out before at all. Um, and I lost 100 pounds in about five or six months. And that was kind of the first real development of like, uh, this is a massive change in my life that I'm making. Um, and looking back, I feel like now, uh, I was just made fun of a lot as a little kid and as a teenager for being overweight. So the way I'm going to count this is I'm going to go so extreme on the opposite end. And there was a reason for that because it was totally not done the healthiest way. Uh, very restricted caloric intake and very long hours working out. Um, and I lost way too much weight, way too quick. Uh, but I think a lot of that stuff stems from like, I'm going to be as self-sufficient as I can because as a little kid, again, my, my siblings are causing some of the issues. I can't cause those same issues to my parents. So I think there's just like a lot of hurt there um, that led to an, an attitude maybe more of it and not being able to, um, and even when I'm thinking about it right now, like going to all of those doctors for so long and you know them giving me what I thought would be the answer and then it's not the answer and I'm just kind of like, okay, well, here's just another thing that's not going to work out. Like, because that's like the shitty, sorry, that's the attitude as a little kid that I, I would observe so much is like, nothing I can do about it. Like I'm stuck. This is how it yeah. is. You know, I can say about it. So um, I don't know. That, that's some of the stuff that I look back and I feel like the, the genetic makeup or the makeup that makes me who I am, that's a big piece of, of who it is. And um, now at this point, metamorphosis, like if my wife was here talking with you guys as well, she'd probably say the same thing. But, you know, four or five years ago, if I needed um, some time away, if I needed to go hang out with my buddies, if I needed to be gone all day, if I needed to go just get away from the house and get away from the kids because life is heavy sometimes, I never would have mm -hmm. been willing to say it four or five years ago. And now, like, I'm very much willing to say it. 
uh, speak up a, a little bit, right? And say that I, I have these issues and I'm having these challenges and I need to go get some time for myself. I mean, those are big compromises and big things to do, but they're ultimately like things that in my mind, you need to be able to come to terms with and be willing to change if you want some of the stuff to be reconciled. Yeah. It's like it's emotional freedom is that you're speaking about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like once you notice that you have some feelings about things and yeah. you can acknowledge them and say them out loud. So how, how does that go with um, your, your way of, um, like when you're working out, um, t can you just talk a little bit about that? about that freedom that that workout gives you um, for, for the for the uh, part, uh, for the audience do you, do you know what I mean like you're you're in there and I can see those great big weights behind <laughs> you and they're probably about I don't know 20 kilos or something I was gonna say they're in kilos which everywhere <laughs> but the United States acknowledges as the <laughs> proper system yeah so you probably have three or four of those on your bar so tell me or share with us that that freedom that it gives you that that power whatever that like when you sort of you've gone back to your 16 year old self and the power that losing that weight gave you and you were no longer a, a, a source of amusement for people um in the in like this morning what what workout did you do this morning uh, it's called it's it, it's called murph in the crossfit world and it is uh designed to be uh, one mile run, 100, uh, 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 squats, and then one mile running again. Uh, oh, wow. So I did it in about, I did it 45, 45 minutes and 54 seconds or something like that. Incredible. And how many people do that around the world? Oh, I, I mean, I don't know. It's tough, it's tough to say during a pandemic, but I would say under normal circumstances, that number is in the millions. Um, Easily, wow. yeah. yeah. Oh, God. My 5K walk looks like nothing now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Something's better than nothing. Remember that. <laughs> I, I think um, I think I want to just mention, we're not getting too many questions, but I'm seeing a lot of people are making nice comments and, and speaking, saying hello to Rose, and, and um, people are finding your talk very interesting, uh, Eddie. I, I think what I took from what you just said was something about the humility and about this love affair, which, you know, Dr. Gaber Matai, who's in the movie, talks about authenticity. And if you're not authentic with yourself, if you don't know yourself, you're going to get some kind of autoimmune disease. And the only way to have the body heal that disease is to just get to know yourself. And it's really like becoming a friend. And back when you were 16, you had to learn early on that you needed to befriend yourself. And you were taught already, you had the voices talking, but you understood. You know, you were like, I can't really be, be, I got to take care of myself because I don't want to make a problem with the family. So young on, you were learning. And then I think these kind, these kind of voices tripped you up later on in life and then you went back to this humility which happens when you have little daughters mm -hmm. <laughs> you're blessed yep. and i think that was really what i was talking about about this love affair you know there's just no way out unless you go through it and you got to know yourself man woman child um it's an unbelievable and it's a lifelong journey so that's why what's wonderful is when you have TMS, the beauty of it is these tools will help you for life. Uh, and I really appreciate your humility. Um, here comes a question. Let's see if we're going to answer it. This is from Tamara, Tamara Bell. I usually experience pain the day after weight training in my neck when doing an upper body exercise. I always thought that this was just d-o-m-s but could it be t-m-s making me think it's d-o-m-s what's mm. d-o-m-s uh eddie um so it's actually it's funny because it looks like an acronym it is an acronym but most people call it doms just for just for ease but uh it's mm -hmm. delayed onset muscle soreness which um 
happens, right? Like you go and you like, you, like lactic acid, like lactic acid. Yeah, same idea. That's where it's coming from. Um, is that you? You have a head like tomorrow. Nothing's gonna smoke me more tomorrow than the two hundred push-ups that I did. Uh, it's just it's very fatiguing, and um, I can do you know I can do a hundred pull-ups and not necessarily be sore. I can do three hundred air squats and not necessarily be sore. The rain or the run is not going to make me sore. It's those damn push-ups that are going to make me sore. So I'll probably be sore tomorrow. I'll be sore the next day, but by the third day, I'll probably be gone. Um, so uh, it was from Tam Tamara tomorrow. Tamara um, tomorrow, yeah. Tomorrow. Um, I mean, if it goes beyond two or three days to me, that's not really DOMS anymore. Uh, it's perfectly normal to have, um, I don't know what exercise specifically with the neck you would be doing, unless you mean like the traps, like the trapezius muscles. Mm -hmm. those, those can, I mean, I, I certainly will, will light those up in some of my uh, weightlifting. Um, you know, the more shrugging that you do with exercises, mm -hmm. and that'll, that may be sore for two to three days. But to me, there's a really big difference in how a TMS pain feels compared to a, um, a delayed onset muscle soreness pain. <laughs> and I, I wanted to comment on, Rose asked a question earlier, which actually never got answered. Um, you would ask, like, talk about this kind of stuff. I can hear my two beautiful daughters trying to get into the group. Oh, okay. We've got company, have we? <laughs> and make an appearance. Um, <laughs> they want to make an appearance. Yeah, they're, they're, they're very sweet. Actually, I interviewed the five-year-old um, for the podcast a few months ago, which was funny. <laughs> uh, but, Rose, you had asked um, about... I don't remember the exact wording, but it was something like, what has this stuff done to you when you're actually training? Um, yeah, and I will, yeah. I, I will say that a massive thing that it has done for me is uh, I used to be relatively fearful of trying certain movements or heavy weights because I felt that the that, an in, that every injury was going to be something that would take me out of the game for months, right? So I can't risk doing a really heavy deadlift or a really heavy bench or a really oh. heavy squat because that means that if I mess that up, it's going to take a year to, to recover from because that was the, the mindset that I had yeah. from the shoulder injury and all that kind of stuff. But now there's a term in, I, can't, I don't know if it's in surfing or base jumping or whatever, but there's this term called full send, which just means I am, uh, I'm, I, I have no restrictions. I'm going to do whatever and whatever happens, happens. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I feel and doing any sort of weights right now is like, yeah, I can miss the lift and yeah, if I do get hurt, so what? Like it'll last a couple of weeks, a few weeks mm -hmm. maybe. Um, but ultimately yeah. I'm gonna be training again and I really have nothing to be fearful of because it is incredibly hard to sustain a really serious injury. It can happen. Um, but I just, I, I understand now how the body is not nearly as fragile as I think a lot of people would like to believe that it is. It's not, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So it so that's helped me in a really tremendous way. Like there's no, to, in my, if you'd have told me five years ago all the stuff that I could do with my body now, um, I would have said like, you know, no way. I would have needed so much more time to recover. I would have needed so, like now pretty much the mind, the, the thought that I have going into training of really any kind is I just need to be able to balance the caloric energy that I take in with, and the sleep mm -hmm with the amount of energy that I'm putting out mm -hmm. for training, but outside of that, I don't really think about or worry about anything. It's really liberating. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Good point. There's a, yeah, there's, a, there's a question from John Resnick. He's saying, Eddie, sounds like he knows you. Eddie, can, can you talk about the fear of returning to the gym after oh, uh, yeah. doing exercise after uh, an initial injury? Can you talk about that? Um, yes, it's difficult for me to, to assess because I haven't had what I feel like is an injury. I mean, the ankle thing is really the only recent thing that I can talk about, but, um, I know with my shoulder, when I was going through the rehab process and actually just starting new things, uh, starting to do new things for the first time, right? I haven't lifted my arm over my head in eight weeks or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and all those different benchmarks along the way, there had to come a point where I just, sort of close my eyes and just say, all right, I'm doing it. And if it hurts, it hurts. And that's all that it is. And um, just yeah. being able to gain more confidence in that way with the ankle thing. Um, it's kind of along the same lines, but now I can also sort of bring in that knowledge of knowing like a reasonable amount of time for things to heal is, I mean, I don't know what it is, three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, whatever. Um, and then it should be done. Dr. Schubiner had uh, given me a great tip, and, and my listeners a great tip when it comes to injuries, particularly athletic injuries, is that uh, if you injure or tweak something, A, most of the time it should be 100% of it close to it within one to two weeks. 
Um, the marker that he would use to sort of assess yourself on whether this is TMS or not is if the pain lingers and stays and kind of stays in how intense and bad it feels, kind of is a bigger pointer to TMS than anything. He's like, an injury, you should feel incrementally better each day. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. If it doesn't occur in that way, then it's kind of, again, the, the, the case closed idea that um, it, you know, it's not really anything necessarily to be fearful of. So I, I don't know if that uh, answers it, John, specifically. That's the best that I can come up with yeah. <laughs> on that topic. Yeah. And Eddie, it's also what's really important to the, all of our, our members and all of our community is that it's not a science. It's not an, it's not a science. Everybody will heal differently. We're not uh, a textbook number. We all heal differently. Our mind and body have everything to do with it and that people shouldn't not compare, but really just be in their own uh, journey and do do what they can following the the parameters of you know the universal laws that the body and the mind can heal after injury after injury after injury. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Tamara, could I just mention to Tamara yes. that maybe she notices, like Eddie pointed out before, that his pain and his injuries were worse. When, when the um, um, at the quarters where he had to do his uh, good point, know, have his sales. What do you call it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when when you do have pain and you do, especially um, if it's worse after exercise, just ask yourself what else is going on. Just yep. it's a simple, a very very simple question to ask. And you know, the other thing is to dig down because it, it could be so mundane that. You, you wouldn't believe it if somebody said it to you unless you reflected yourself that, yeah, the, the, um, the, the muscle tension is still there, um, you know, 48 hours later or 24 hours later. But, you know, maybe I'm dissatisfied with the training I did or I didn't do it hard enough or I didn't do it long enough or, or uh, you know, all that various um, yep. mindset that comes would, on. Yeah. Would you say that, Eddie, that you're, you're like Rose and I talk a lot about um, her work, which is always talking and focusing on the feelings which are repressed and the defenses people use. But do you would you feel like at, over the period of your years of weightlifting and these injuries, you were self-critical and you were hard on yourself and you were, you know. Um, uh, not so much of the weight training stuff, um, just because I sort of, uh, to me, I feel like I understand that. I'm, I would make a lot of uh, excuses or justifications, like I'm never going to be as good as that guy because that guy X, whatever the thing is. Maybe he's been doing this for 10 years longer than me. Maybe he's on steroids. Maybe, you know, so there's always kind of like a variety of things. I wasn't too hard. If I was more, like if that was my day job and my entire livelihood rested on the fact that I can, you know, snatch 120 kilos or clean and jerk 130 kilos or whatever the case is, then maybe. Um, but oftentimes it would it wouldn't. I don't think that, um, and maybe I'm wrong, but I, I don't feel like a lot of uh, emotional repression or things like that would occur because of anything that really happened in training. Mm. Aside from the only thing maybe is just that, uh, Eddie, how could you dislocate your shoulder and take a shot at that weight? You're so stupid. Like that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. but, that, but, but that happened, you know, one isolated time. Um, mm. But outside of that, I'm, I mean, especially now, like uh, – you know, a bad training session or whatever, or a bad cycle or whatever it is. Like, I think now I'm I'm really good at being able to pull good things out. Like, I have friends that will be that will be on the same they'll be on the same training cycles, and you know, maybe they only achieve a one or two kilo increase in a lift over a twelve week cycle. Uh -huh. Oh, this sucks! And I'm like thinking, man, it might like. Uh, there's a board that I made right to the left of me that has. Uh, the max weight I've hit in, I, t I picked 16 different movements and the date to which I hit them. Some of these records are on there for six or seven or eight years that I haven't been able to pass since then. Um, but it's just, you know, it's just the, the way of, it's just the way that it is. And I can always find, I can always pull something out of a good cycle. Maybe I didn't increase anything and I worked at this thing every day for 12 weeks. Uh, but you know what? I felt a lot more confident in this one thing that I did. So, um, I'm pretty good at that, whereas I wasn't. I, I might not have been as good. Like I would just sort of. Be able to okay, that's yeah. It's not about you now. It's about it, that transition that mm -hmm. we need to sort of look at. 
what the, the transition from like a 16 year old finding yourself overweight and then just full on yeah getting it yeah, right yeah. down yeah um, and and then that that that's where i sort of saw that sort of gritty idea in, in you um so how do we trans how do we translate that to someone that hasn't hasn't found it you know it's probably there but they can't find it yet and yet um that would would you have been self-critical at that time back about, in being yeah, 16 like as a teenager uh certainly um because yeah. i usually would do i would like weigh myself at the end of a week as an example and if it wasn't a number that i felt like it should be um based on the previous you know based on the work that i had put out at the time um mm -hmm. then it did sort of feel like a, what did i just do all did i do anything all week and then thinking that i you know had some kind of like it didn't it wasn't as linear as i thought it should be um mm -hmm. now i i feel like uh I feel like the world's kind of a different place when it comes to uh, losing weight in general. But I, I mean, I think I'm not a personal trainer, so I don't know. But I know that I was doing consulting for um, performance athletes a few years ago uh, for nutrition, and there was a bunch of us on this team, and I was really the only one that was talking about. Uh, and this was way pre-Sarno stuff: um, a movement in weight, or a deficiency in training, or whatever the case is, or a lack of movement, movement and scale weight for the week. Uh, what was your sleep, stress, and hydration levels like the week before? Um, that maybe it's not everything sort of that you think it is. And I would just talk a lot about uh, the amount of cortisol maybe that your body is being filled with at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. And that was stuff that I understood like years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, you know, I didn't, that's kind of where I also stopped paying any credence to whatever was the scale said. So it went from, and to me, the, the big difference in like a, a fitness or a gym goer versus an athlete is that you sort of go your markers instead of being um, what does the scale look like this week now become how did I perform in this week? Um, yeah, yeah. It's a healthier, yeah, and uh, it's healthier. also like oh. yeah, it's it, it's way easier where if I have you know five uh, very dynamic workouts in a week to pull something that I did really well out of all of those opportunities I had in that previous five days than just this one moment where I step on the scale and who knows like. Maybe I only lost a pound, but maybe I haven't pooped that day. You know what I mean? Like it's very <laughs> difficult to, to gauge how you're going to feel on what the scale looks like. And um, unfortunately, I think a lot of people do go there. But I feel like it's very different than it was yeah. 18 years ago. Now. Yeah. Of course, yeah. yeah. Um, and and even the whole idea of breaking through to the other side of the of the pain, yeah. um, it almost seems like it's indifferent to you now it's yep. not maybe it was your friend before because it it held you back and now it it's just something that uh is a companion or whatever I don't, eddie that um makes sense eddie do you think um that you meditate sometime i mean are you a meditator number one and number two do you think when you're weightlifting and you're pushing whether it's on a skateboard or that you're sort of doing some mindfulness and meditation is, I would think that'd be a perfect balance, you know, for the intensity of what your body and mind are doing regarding weightlifting. And so um, I think that universally, unless uh, you are a Buddhist that's living in the, that's living in the mountains or the Alps or whatever, and you're practicing meditation as your, that's your livelihood. I feel like almost everybody thinks they really suck at it. <laughs> and I felt that way for a long time. And then people would ask me, uh, I actually have an old journalism teacher from high school who owns some yoga studios around here. And she would say to me, uh, she has this quote, she's known me since I was 16 or 17 years old and we're still keeping contact today and I adore her. Um, and she has this phrase where she goes, I know you say you're not religious, but you're really spiritual. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it's it's interesting because I've always thought that I sucked at meditation. And then when I would try and like sit down and do the, I don't know how well you can see all this, but like, you know, the holding of the finger and like the, mm, like sort of what you would see on TV or a movie. I would try, oh, yeah. try, I'd, I'd try and do that for 15 or 20 or 25 minutes or whatever. And then I would, but like all these, or I downloaded like an app that would have me do a 12 minute one or something like that. I always felt at the end of it, I'm like, 
all I did was just think about how much life sucked for the last 12 minutes. Having like an actual practice never really helped me in that way. But then, uh, I don't know, in the last year I've started thinking, you know, all these little things that you do really are meditation because meditation is just mindfulness. So something mm -hmm. as was right before we started, uh, it stopped raining here for like an hour. So I was like, I want to go get some more steps in. And there's this cool park with this cool trail that's near our house. And literally just going on that walk and sort of zoning out. And, you know, I'm, I'm literally like, I'm just, to me at this point in time, like looking at a plant or looking at a, a, a cool landscape of a bunch of different trees, like I'm observing them and I'm noticing them. And that's all that I'm looking at and thinking about that is that's yeah. meditation, right? It's not, it doesn't have to be sitting down in a pillow and home and humming and all that stuff. And then right before bed, um, right before I fall asleep, there's usually, I, I usually just do very similar. In fact, exactly what we did at the beginning with the breathing stuff. That is exactly what I do before I fall asleep. And I, I might go through, I don't know, five or six reps of that, meaning a breathe in, a hold it and a breathe out five or six times. And I'm like, I'm out. Wow. Time, that never happened. Dr. Hanscom in his book talks a lot about um, the necessity of sleep, which is something I really devalued. When my pain was at its worst, I was sleeping four or five hours a night and I did, I just thought that, you know, they don't have one, you know, they don't have, they're not connected at all. Um, but then when I, when I met with a therapist not long after that, and the first question he asked me was how much do you sleep? I'm like, oh, four or five hours. And you know, it's not a big deal. I, I, I get up early in the morning and that kind of thing. And, uh, he had said like, you got to focus more on this thing tell you why. On rest. Yeah. Yeah. On actually like resting and being able to balance it out. Um, mm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, mindfulness to me comes in all sorts of places. And uh, there's a special that has been airing the last two months on Michael Jordan um, and the Chicago Bulls. And Michael Jordan is the greatest NBA player, the greatest basketball player probably that's ever lived. And the very last episode, one of the writers who was talking about what made him so great was really very telling. And it's been on my brain so much since he said it, uh, is that... Michael Jordan was not the best of all time because of how high he could jump or how well he could shoot or how well he did all these other things. It was that 100% of the time he was in the moment and wow. had, had mindfulness and literally would focus on one task. And they asked him about that. And he said, why would I worry about a shot I haven't even taken yet? And I just thought like, oh man. And they, they the, the writer had said, you know, guys will move to India and live there 20 years and meditate 16 hours a day and they will never get right. to a place that Michael got. And that's, right. that's, that was the separator. It wasn't the running and the jumping and the scoring and the shooting and the dunking and all that kind of stuff. It was literally just, he was only focused on whatever it was he was doing at that particular moment. And that is mindfulness in its truest sense. Right. But, I, but, I, I, but uh, I just want to say that it's, it's not just Michael Jordan. It's the human mind can do that. Mm -hmm. Right, Rose? Anyone can do that. Yeah. Well, uh, what I'd like to ask you about now is, um, you know, when you're doing weights mm -hmm. and the moment before you actually do that weight, you're not, it, it's sort of like that whole Michael Jordan thing. Just talk about that for a moment because, you know, you've got a very, you know, uh, what do you call it? Um, heavy weight on, uh, on the bar mm -hmm. and you, you're setting your feet up. So, What's happening in your mind at that time? <laughs> You're setting your feet up and you know that um, I'm pushing myself a little bit extra or whatever. You know, what's happening inside in your psyche at that time? Because it seems to me that it's very much like smelling the flowers when you're going on your walk. But yeah, um, uh, could you talk about that for a moment? So uh, it's funny you ask that. Um, I was actually, I was thinking about this not long ago, five years ago, um, when I'd be training all the time, I remember that I would say, you got to make this weight. 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 That was all that was going through my mind as I walked up to it. That's a tremendous amount of pressure. Uh, and now when I walk up to a really heavy weight, especially if it's like a squat or anything that is on bearing on your body while you're, while you're going to do it, I'll stand there. I'll kind of think about it for a second. I'll be looking at the bar. I'm kind of, you know, I'm getting myself set, I'm strapping in my belt or whatever. And then I literally say to myself the exact same thing every time. It's not going to get lighter the longer you think about it, asshole. That's what, <laughs> that's what I said. Excellent. Um, and I just and I just walk up and I put it on my back and I squat down and I get back up and I'm like, it wasn't so bad, right? So it's very, 
Um, it seems very small and very subtle, but it's like really the difference in like, are you really enjoying what you're doing and are you doing it out of place of fear? Or are you thoroughly enjoying what you're doing and doing it out of a place of love? And that is 100%. Mm. Do you think, Eddie, uh, as we as we wind up a little bit now, do you think that that, that whole take home sort of uh, experience would be for for our our audience that they when they put on their um, their running shoes and they're going to go and do exercise or go to the gym or whatever um, that they ha do it in love, in compassion, in mindfulness. What do you know? You know, like moving from well, I can't do it, and I'm I'm in too much pain. That sciatica is really getting at me. When they bend down over over all the pain to do up their shoelaces or whatever, uh, or their straps. Um, could you say something about the mindfulness or the inner thoughts or the inner experience that they would hold to get them through to go from putting those um, shoes on to actually doing the exercise in the same way that you said about going to those weights. I've got really heavy weights going, but I'm just going to, you know, I'm not going to worry about the, 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 the amount of weight. I'm more interested in the doing of it. Does, mm -hmm. Am I? Yeah. Am I so uh, yeah. I think, there's a, I think there's a couple answers to that. Number one is, uh, are you focusing on the task? Are you focusing about things that are outside of the task? Uh, I think would be number one. You can throw your running shoes on and go run for a run around the block or whatever it is that you want to do. And to me, the biggest difference in whether or not you're going to hurt on that run or, or have a great time on that run is if you're thinking about the run or you're thinking about the kids you have to pick up later, the dinner that you have to make, and the boss you got to talk to tomorrow while you're on the run. That will 100% to me make the difference on whether or not this is going to be a good training session. So um, so that's the first thing. Uh, but also, like, you know, do you – like, for me, I, I, I just don't do a lot of things anymore that I don't actually enjoy. I, I you know, there's a phrase um, – I don't even know what the phrase is because I think it's so dumb. But the, in the CrossFit world, um, that you have to work on your weaknesses or work on the things that you suck at. And that's, like, kind of the whole idea that these things that you totally hate, you have to work on them all the time um, because you're not going to get any better at them unless you practice, which is true in a sense that you have to get – you, you know, you have to practice something in order to get better at it. But also at the same time, um, if I totally hate something and I'm not enjoying it, I'm likely not in the moment while I'm doing it. And so how much, you know, how much really, how much pleasure am I really going to get out of that at the, you know, at, at the time? So I just don't do a lot of things that I don't uh, enjoy anymore. I think a lot of what um, fitness and exercise and training and stuff like that, in a lot of ways, it sounds kind of odd. It's like accentuate what you have that's positive and, Kind of hide what you have that's negative. Um, like for instance, I don't. I, I'm not a great deadlifter, as an example. I'm not a great bencher, uh, so I don't do it as often as I do snatch and you know snatch and clean and jerks and all that kind of stuff because I enjoy that stuff a lot better. It brings me joy. I feel like it. Like when I I remember the the day that I uh, stood up a 271 pound or 123 kilo uh, clean. I when I pulled the bar, I remember thinking I have no chance. Even if I catch this thing, there's no way I'm standing up with it. And, uh, and I stood up with it. I was like, oh, man, like that, I felt as close to a superhero as I possibly could. Um, you know, that's just the way, like, I, I enjoy that stuff, so I'm going to do the yeah. stuff that I enjoy. I don't, I don't know if that uh, answers the question or not. Well, yeah, well, it does in, in a way. It, well, what you're actually saying is um, do the things, especially with exercise, that you enjoy and get the pleasure with. And, of course, then the pain will subside. And and um, and then there's there's space when the, when the pain subsides there's space and it gives the patient the person should I say a chance to actually say to themselves well what else is going on for me why why am I um, why am I so self critical or you know where did that come from is it really me yeah yeah. All right. Okay. Are there any more questions? No, lots of people are watching. More but, of a discussion. Uh, people are commenting. I'm glad that they're hanging out in our in our chat room. I love it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, shall we wind up and yeah. just just stay quiet in our bodies and again go back 
into our bodies. We've been talking about weights. We've been talking about exercise. Now, as our minds have moved to what we can and cannot do within exercise and notice the self-criticism that's going on about what you cannot do, let's see what we can do. The simple thing of allowing that beautiful body to rest. It's a very powerful thing we've got. And sometimes our minds wrestle with our bodies. Let our mind rest and our body go into calmness, deep calmness, recognizing what's happening in your jaw, recognize what's happening in your shoulders right now. Loosen them if they're tight. Those muscles on your neck are holding hard onto something. Just let them go. There's no threats, no dangers here at the moment. Let them go. Allow the hips to release, to let go. There's no need to run anywhere at the moment unless there's a threat beside you. So let them allow them, allow them to just stay calm and in a quiet, serene experience. And if you close your eyes now and take a breath, the breath comes in through the nose around the nasal passages and down into the lungs. So we're joining, we're connecting the mind and the body. They're one and our breath allows us to see that in every moment of our day. But often we're too busy to notice. So if we just breathe in slowly, be aware of the fresh breath going down into our, into our lungs, hold it then let it out through our mouths and let the pain and the stress and the expectations go out through our mouths and release us. I just want to thank you all for being with us today. I especially want to thank Eddie for his insights. Yeah. It's just been really wonderful having him on. And um, and if you can find time to watch his podcast, it will be very helpful for you. And, and see what those other trainers and that have done. But not to put yourself against them and say, I cannot do it. But to see as you step up to the bar, as Eddie was saying, it's what you're doing in the moment. It's not what you're trying to achieve. Or as Michael Jordan said, I don't worry about hitting that goal. I worry about being present at the present mm -hmm. moment yeah. as that ball comes to me. Yeah, I think amazing. it's very appropriate. Yeah. So thank great. you all. Thank you, Tova. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Eddie. Have a great day. Yeah. Good night. Thank you both. See you Take next care. week. Bye-bye. All right, bye.